<laughs> Greetings. Thank you for this opportunity. It's a pleasure to be with you. And on this presentation today, I'm going to talk about the pharmacy touch points in primary healthcare. And in line with the theme for HOPA Symposium this year, pharmacy is in a practice in a dynamic world. The key thing would be, what are the opportunities for us as pharmacists in primary healthcare to touch on the lives of patients, to improve access to care, and beyond doing that, promote the prestige and the value of the profession of pharmacy for this generation and into the next generation. So in terms of presentation that I'm having today, the key bit that we're looking at is, we know that healthcare delivery has moved local to the very communities. And that is one of the things that is espoused by the pillar number eight of the SDG3 on universal healthcare coverage. And as we are doing this, the question is, what are pharmacists doing in the primary healthcare levels of practice? How are pharmacists touching the lives of patients who really depend on them to be their point of care and the point of solutions to their healthcare problems? So these kind of changes are taking us closer to patients who need us. And it's a moment for us as pharmacists to identify what opportunities lie in these areas. How are we going to address them? And these are kind of components that we now need to integrate from the current conversation that have been ongoing on pharmaceutical care, clinical practice settings, yes. The pharmaceutical care is important and it is of paramount importance to the patients and the lives that we're impacting in the advanced levels of care. But in the community level where patients have more challenges and probably even more constraints in terms of accessing care, we need to look at what are the pain points, what are the needs and the solutions that we can provide, and especially so as experts who are the point of care to deliver these solutions. So with this kind of an approach, then we need to realize that we need to adopt a systems thinking approach. It's not about pharmacists as medicines experts only, but experts in offering healthcare solutions and addressing the underlying challenges and constraints that patients have in terms of accessing the healthcare services they need. And one of the things that I would commend as one of the advances we've had in the industry is the review of the pharmacy and poisons internship programs. This saw the inclusion of primary healthcare practice as a component of the internship training. With this, we had the opportunity to interact with patients in their local healthcare centers, the dispensers are related. And in these kind of interventions, we get to meet them before they get referred higher up in the referral system where they might come with complications or even with, where in the communities where their challenges are not being addressed the best way possible, but that is the only solution they know, the only avenue they feel they could get the help they needed. So being taken that to those communities, we have an impact to play. And in this presentation, what I'm going to be very critical about is what opportunities exist for us? What we, how can we tap into these opportunities? And what is our common call in terms of advancing primary healthcare? And it's based on observations that I've had, experiences that I've had as well in terms of practice in the period that I've been in practice. And this will be enumerated per pillar of my presentation. So the first one I would talk about management of neglected tropical diseases. We all know we have neglected tropical diseases and as per the name, they are neglected diseases and neglected conditions in our space. However, it doesn't mean that patients are not suffering from them. Patients are still suffering and they need help in terms of interventions. And in this case, one of the key things that happened to me is during my internship training at Kenyatta National Hospital, I, was, I had my three weeks of experiential training at level three pharmacy. And in this case, I was interacting with patients at pediatric wards. And that particular moment, I got to realize that there were patients who were suffering from visceral leishmaniasis, Salazar, in other words. And at this particular moment, there were sometimes we had challenges accessing the medicines, some other times, even the diagnosis that was being made was being made at an advanced stage of the disease. I remember there was a kid that I, ha I had to attend to and he had been referred from the hospital. I was meeting him in May, 2020, yet the initial presentation at the Kenyatta National Hospital was in November, 2019. So that was seven months down the line and there was not a diagnosis. Actually, they even went to the extent of looking at the probabilities of the kid having cancer. So how, what happens to these kind of patients? Because at a community, at a hospital level, that is Kenyatta National Hospital, it's a tertiary institution. We expect people to be presenting with complications or advanced kind of conditions. Neglected tropical diseases are not as advanced. And therefore, the clinical suspicion would definitely be low in any setting. So how do we go beyond this? And this is some of the things that over that period, what I realized is we need to work within the local settings to ramp up their capacity, to build capacity. And over that period, there was a project that I started. I did some proposals, some request letters to a couple of partners. And what we got to realize as well is stakeholders and partners are willing to come on board. 
but there is need for someone to spearhead the process. With this need for leadership to adopt such kind of interventions and engage in terms of how do we make it happen and how do we ensure it's sustainable? Because I remember having an interaction with the CEO of DNDI, the executive director from the country, country manager. And in that conversation, they were willing to support. But being that NTDs was a component of the Ministry of Health as a responsibility, then the proposal and the interventions would be better coordinated from the, D, the, D, the NTDs department. And at that particular moment, there was not much I could do as an intern in the facility. There was not much I could push for from the ministry perspective. And therefore, what I did to the level that I could was ensure that we get access and supplies of medicines for the patients who needed them. And for those who didn't have access, we tried mobilizing in the different avenues that were possible. But beyond that particular experience and the incidents that we have, what if pharmacists at the point of care thought beyond just providing and availing the medicines to the patients who needed them? and intervened in terms of mobilizing partners and stakeholders to provide primary healthcare facilities, building capacity of clinicians and caregivers at the community level to be able to have a diagnosis, detect these kind of incidences and to treat these patients. That would be a win for both of all of us and the patients and their communities. Knowing there were kind of hotspots, for example, this one was in Kitui County, Kaseluni. If we knew this is the case, then we know the control measures that are available we can intervene and mobilize stakeholders to ensure we have environmental protection measures, these in terms of vector control and related. That would be a win for the community. And then in terms of the referral system, how comes a kid is coming from a dispenser in the primary healthcare level facility to a level three and to a level four, then from that level four facility, Mwingi hospital, they're being referred to a level six hospital. Yet nobody has intervened or even identified the problem. Are we in touch with the patients? And if you're not in touch, then how do we make it happen? And I think we need to adopt a system-wide approach and look at the challenges. The patients need our care. And it is our responsibility to intervene and give them the care they need, from preventive measures to the curative and rehabilitative where necessary. And in that continuum of care, the most neglected of diseases will not be neglected as much because we will not have them in the first place to be neglected. We'll have eradicated them by ensuring we have community-wide systemic interventions that are protecting the people who really need our help. Another area that I feel we have an opportunity is on management of non-communicable diseases. And when you talk about non-communicable diseases, I'll be specific on some of the chronic conditions that have been involved in the care and of patients, that is diabetes and hypertension. I mentioned initially that internship program by PPB is a good model because we got to interact with patients at the primary healthcare facilities. I had the opportunity of practicing at Kasarani Health Center that was after Kenyatta National Hospital for two months. And in this experience, I got to work at the pharmacy. That is normally where everybody thinks you should be working. So the clinician in charge referred me to take charge of the pharmacy and coordinate care for patients. The first one week, the second week, most of the things that I was doing was ensuring they have access to medicine, dispensing medication generally, that is what we do. But beyond dispensing of medication, if I'm dispensing out of stock all along, it won't be of bene any benefit. So based on that kind of finding, we had a discussion with the in charge and he mentioned that initially there were partners who are willing to come on board and engage with patients with non-communicable diseases. And that became the genesis of the Kasarani NCDs clinic, which is a patient support group for the patients. We continued and one of the things that we did was have an engagement with meds for continued supply of medicines. And in that case, patients would pay $5, that's 500 Kenya shillings on a monthly basis, regardless of how much your medication cost, these patients are able to continue getting their medicines. And we all understand that these are chronic conditions, so therefore patients depend on lifelong access to medication. So if we can ensure the reliable access is in place, and beyond that with health communication, positive lifestyle changes, positive living and related, then that would work. And in, on the side you see there's a picture that I've provided. This is one of the sessions where I was offering education to the patients with discussing some of the challenges we are having. And over COVID-19, we also acknowledge these were the most at risk patients. So over that period, it was a moment for us to intervene and give them the assurance and also offer the care they needed. And if we do these kind of interventions in our communities, it's not only within the primary healthcare facilities. If you are a pharmacist running a community pharmacy, what if you intervened and established a clinic or a care system for patients with non-communicable diseases, diabetes, hypertension, and related? You have medicines, you can design a program, you can collaborate with stakeholders, and even document the findings that you have so that you can have a structured care. And this structured care can inform some other best practices and models of care for patients with non-communicable diseases. 
the second, the third case that I have is on mental health. And mental health, it's not been a discussed topic in most of our spaces, even within the pharmacy space. And COVID-19 was a blessing in disguise, in the sense that people got to realize the impact of isolation and mental health as a component of care that was not being addressed. And therefore, with this kind of a moment, we got to realize that people need services. People need mental health care and services and support, but they're not accessible. In healthcare, in terms of the gap in access to mental health care, so we talk about deficiencies in human workforce. But as pharmacists, through our training, we have a component on psych psychotherapy, from pharmacological therapy for mental disorders and related. So from that, and then we look at the patient care component, counseling and related. And even in some other advanced training programs, we have counseling, we have psychosocial counseling and related. We have psychotherapy, psychology. If we could equip ourselves as pharmacists to be able to offer mental health services, psychosocial counseling, referral services, we can create awareness in our community. And once diagnosed with some of the mental diseases, these patients will still come for us for medication. Can we offer the medication therapy monitoring that is we are hailing in our practice as a component of care within the mental health space? Because if we do, that would be a win for all of us. And some of the things that I notice we have to do in these spaces is that we need to engage patients and our preferential positioning in the healthcare system is of advantage when you talk about mental health. Often patients will present with symptoms that might be considered as some of the normal physical conditions, physical illnesses. But then in mental health space, we can identify them. Because if, for example, somebody is depressed, but they will come with fatigue and related weaknesses, lack of appetite and related, would feel it's an infection. It might not be. So if you can be equipped to detect, offer the psychosocial support that is needed, if you're not able to offer the intervention that I need to offer a referral system, a referral to other specialists who are able to cater for the patient, you'll have made an impact in that person's life. Our preferential position, the first line of contact when we talk about community pharmacies, because we all acknowledge most of the care is being received from pharmacies, whether being manned by pharmacists, quacks, farm techs, whoever is managing them, most of us will reach out to them. So if we can, as pharmacists, equip ourselves to be able to offer these services, it would be a preferential advantage as a competitive advantage as well. In the hospital settings, the last point of contact will always be the pharmacists at the pharmacy or even the farm techs who are practicing them. So if a patient has been seen by a doctor and they come to you, and then you realize that probably there would have been a psychosocial problem that had, been, had not been addressed, then this is a point for you as a pharmacist to intervene and help this patient. And those are areas that are critical. And I remember over COVID-19 on, right on, on my right when you see the PowerPoint, the picture that I have, pharmacy and mental health bridging the care gap. And this was a survey generally that I just did a brief one to identify what is the perception of the public on what the role of pharmacists could be. And generally, majority of the people thought we could have, a, we had an impact. Unfortunately, they believed we are more equipped than we really believe we are as pharmacy by ourselves. So those are some of the things that we need to look into. You can access the link on our website, Reculture Health and Social Innovation. It's reculture.org. Then you look at mental health, pharmacy and mental health bridging the care gap. Then we have the sexual reproductive health. The Constitution of Kenya, Article 48, talks about every Kenyan having the right to quality, the highest attainable quality of healthcare services, including sexual reproductive health and services. Unfortunately, most of our pharmacies have not taken a central space in terms of advancing access to sexual reproductive health services, other than dispensing and selling their sexual reproductive health materials and products only. Most of us, we are selling contraceptives. We are selling menstrual hygiene materials like sanitary towels, tampons, pads, and related. Beyond that, we sell the sexual enhancement of drugs, Viagra and related, Sildenafil that is, then we could move to the aspect on premature ejaculation, just giving, selling the products and advising the patients. What if we could position ourselves as strategic rather than dealing with movement of a product to get a sale, as pharmacists practicing in the primary healthcare setting, identify challenges, bridge this gap by promoting system-wide innovations and innovative interventions that are key. One key example I would mention is on menstrual hygiene. Over COVID-19, the government had already instituted earlier program on promoting access to menstrual hygiene products. This was being stalled. And we all know in every single community, there is a pharmacy. What if we designed a program as pharmacists working in the community setting to have the government distribution channels through our community pharmacies? How impactful would that be to ensure the needy ladies who need these products can access them? That would be a win for all of us. Look at it in terms of the aspect now, the other bit is male sexuality. 
most of the times when we talk about sexual reproductive health, we are talking about contraceptives, majorly for women. We are talking about sexually related problems for women and all that. What about focusing on what are the challenges men are having with their sexuality? Over the last two or three months, I've had interaction with some men in, our, in the community where I live and in a pharmacy that I normally visit once in a while. And these people are coming with challenges, but they don't know where they can access the care. People are coming with premature ejaculation, erectile dysfunction, infertility, or sterility, if you could call it. But there's no solution on how they can address this. What are we doing as pharmacists to address some of these systemic challenges? They might not be addressed in the main overall overview of systems, but as pharmacists, we can do something. And I think those are key areas that we need to intervene and make our impact be felt. I've been in the advocacy space on sexual reproductive health. I've been in the advocacy space for mental health and I've intervened on NTDs and NCDs as I mentioned. And I believe we have a role to play. It's about thinking for the system, thinking for the patient and focusing on reimagining our practice as pharmacists and the role we need to play to ensure patients have the best outcomes. And the value of our profession is actually felt by the people who really matter. The patients, the people who care for them, and the people who have a responsibility to ensure availability of these services. That is patients, payers, the government, and ourselves as pharmacists, because that is our obligation and our responsibility. And to make this happen, documentation has to be key. There's no way we are ever going to promote best practices in science and best practices and advancement of profession if we are not documenting what we do. We have to document what we're doing. We have to share best practices with each other. And this is a platform where we are sharing these best practices and interventions or ideas that we have. We need to collaborate by sharing experiences and collaborate by engaging each other. Kenyatta National Hospital has the best antimicrobial stewardship program. If we can scale that and even engage community pharmacies in terms of advancing antimicrobial stewardship, it will be a win for everyone. And it will be a win for primary healthcare with pharmacies' role in it. At policy engagement, our practices should inform policies, not policies regulating what we practice. Because at the end of the day, the practice is meeting what the patients and the public need. But the policy should be responding to that need. If we don't engage in policy, the practice will be watered down because we'll not have the purview and the opportunity to innovate and to be creative in advancing practice and the care of patients. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I believe we are going to do better and we're going to serve the profession in a better way. Thank you.